welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is the uh, James A. McKee Association's monthly community <laughs> conversation. And um, I just wanna welcome again, everybody. Um, I'm gonna turn the program over to Don, who is our community conversations coordinator, who will be introducing our topic and our um, speakers for this afternoon. And then we'll jump right in. So again, and silverware, so I think. Silverware, you yeah. got it. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, there's a spoon hiding under there, but I can get you out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you mute the silverware, please. Okay, yes. so where, where's the mute button? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We'll do. Uh, that was funny. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Our topic today is the second of a renewal of the community conversations. Uh, last month, we had our superintendent of schools just talking about the schools in general. Uh, and next month, on May 26, Jerry Sutton will present. Uh, on the redistricting process that is about to happen statewide. I'll say a bit more of that as we close, uh, but that next session will be May 26th. In today's session, uh, the Citizens for Preservation of Mills Lawn Green Space, uh, Bernadine Parks, Terry Smith, Michael Slaughter will share their concerns and some background information about Mills Lawn Land. Terry, are you pinpointing this or who's? Yeah, I, we, I, thought, I thought maybe we'd go ahead and introduce ourselves individually um, to everybody that doesn't know us. I'm Terry Smith. Uh, I've been a resident of Yellow Springs now for almost three years. Uh, I'm a past elementary teacher and a past uh, college professor in uh, science and geography. And I'm currently working for the National Geographic Teacher Certification Program uh, as an instructor online from right, from right here in good Yellow Springs. Yeah. I'm Bernadine Parks. Um, I've lived in Yellow Springs for 30 years now and in the area most of my life. Um, Yellow Springs has been part of my life as long as I can remember, even though I grew up in Enon. Um, I am, uh, by training, a clinical counselor. I'm mostly retired now. Um, and in addition to uh, private practice and working in a number of agencies, I also spent about 20 years um, teaching in the, as an adjunct in the counselor ed department at Wright State. Um, so that's who I am. I'm Michael Slaughter. Uh, I grew up in this town. I've been in and out of here for probably the past 50 years. Uh, my family, my mother was a teacher at Mills Lawn. Uh, I got my degree in electrical engineering, worked for a number of companies all over the place, East Coast, West Coast, uh, doing a fair amount of consulting business in that same field uh, from Yellow Springs. Okay, that's who we are. We're going to start our presentation. Uh, Bernadine is speaking first. And I wanted to just let everybody know that the slides you're seeing, we're going to send those to the McKee group. And you'll have access to all those to read them later. So we, we won't exactly read every single slide. We're just going to sort of narrate our way through this. And then we're ready to take questions. And then noting that we're only three members of this group of nine people that are, that are here with you today. So I thought it'd be better if we didn't have nine people all talking at the same time about this. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bernadine now and share my screen. Let's see if this is going here. Is that working? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I can see you and hear you. Okay, well, welcome. Um, We've entitled our presentation Mills Lawn Past, Present and Future because we think that um, the past certainly should inform the future. And what you see in front of you is an 1855 map. And if William Mills were to walk into Yellow Springs today, he would be very familiar um, with what exists today because the bones of Yellow Springs are related to William Mills' vision. Next slide, Terry. 
But before William Mills came in about uh, 1804, when the Europeans came, they quickly identified the springs and touted it for its health visit health benefits. But the thing that was really interesting to me that as early as 1812, a vision of Yellow Springs was a gleam in Lewis Dale, Davis's eyes. He said it was a town with streets, squares, courts, and public walks, all of which will be open forever while it was mainly virgin uh, forest. Next slide, Terry. So in 1842, Elisha Mills deeded 600 acres to his, his son, William. And William promptly set to work platting out 300 acres, which as I've said, is the bones of Yellow Springs. He um, built uh, his mansion and it really was a mansion by the standards of the time, installed extensive gardens, walkways, uh, driveways, and it was all open for the public. So by 1855, his vision was actualized. He, he really is the father of Yellow Springs being in the railroad, Antioch College, paving the streets, platting the village. Um, and by 1866, he was in financial trouble, so he was forced to sell Mills Lawn. Next slide, Terry. And so um, for the next 60 plus years, the property was in the hands of uh, the Means family, and it was not used. It was initially bought as a summer home or a secondary home, but over the 60 years, the, the property was used to entertain dignitaries, and it was the site of a lot of important things that happened in Yellow Springs. In 1921, uh, Arthur Morgan purchased uh, the property for Antioch College. And it's interesting because of the location that the Means family did not sell it for development. They sold it to Antioch. And Antioch uh, used the property un until they passed it on in 1945. The original property, uh, the Mills Lawn extended to Davis Street. And that was all where the lawn and the mansion was. And when uh, Morgan bought the property, he installed Limestone Street from Phillips Street to Xenia Avenue and developed the Davis Street, Limestone Street block as housing for Antioch faculty. So all that lovely housing there was developed for Antioch. Um, in 1945, next slide, Terry. Um, President Henderson, proposed uh, give, gifting Mills Lawn to the community. Uh, President Henderson and the Antioch trustees recognized the special value of this property, that it was important to the community at, at a number of levels. And so they wanted to pass it on to an official or unofficial body um, that would preserve it and make it indefinitely available to the community. At the same time, the school board was looking to replace the union school and looking for a place to site the elementary school. Antioch was initially reluctant to pass it to the schools because they felt that the property um, was too large to, to sustain the schools, but the village passed on it. And so eventually it went to uh, the school board. Next slide, Terry. And I'm not gonna read through this, but I'd encourage you when you get the slides to read it because there's a lot of documentation at the time of the transfer about what the understanding was between the school board and Antioch. They clearly wanted it to be used for community purposes and they wanted as much as possible of it to be preserved as a park. There were a lot of old growth trees. Next slide, Terry. And so um, in 1949, the deed was passed to the, to the school board. It was given unrestricted, but if you look at all of the reporting uh, at the time that that was going on, it was very clear that, that the Antioch expected the school board to honor the vision for what would happen to that property. So since that time, the property um, has uh, been maintained through school levy dollars. So every one of us is paid to support and uh, maintain that property. When they put the school on it, there was some community pushback about siting it on Walnut Street because of the old growth forest and they had to cut down a lot of trees and that the community were also concerned because siting the school would obstruct the, the mansion itself. 
The mansion was raised by the school board rather quickly in 1966 for lack of 30 to $40,000 to rehabilitate it. I think that's about 250,000 in today's money. So we lost an architectural treasure to this community. And so since 1949, you're all aware how it's been used. Certainly, you know, it's a playground, not only for our school children, but for young families, uh, baseball, disc golf, um, and a site for tribute tree plantings. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Michael now. And as we do, note that the final picture at the far right, Michael Slaughter is actually in that baseball picture. Oh, wow. Cool. If you go to the website, <laughs> you'll see a much larger picture, and you can, you can spot Michael. Amongst a number of other old timers in that picture. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, the, the community residents around Phillips and Elm Street uh, we discovered an issue in the development of the comprehensive land use plan. Uh, at that time, it was highlighted that they were proposing a series of diagonal parking spots along Phillips and Elm Street. And that was to provide additional parking for downtown businesses. At that time, we generated a petition uh, and presented that to village council and we successfully got that removed from the parking plan. Based on that particular uh, situation, we discovered that the Mills Lawn property was zoned for commercial and high density housing. This prompted the formation of our group with the goal of preserving the Mills Lawn green space. And as if you look at the last two bullets, um, it's a treasured space and we believe there's a compromise to protecting that space and whatever decisions the school board makes moving forward uh, for, for their needs. Next slide. So what we decided to do to garner support and inform the community, uh, we put together a number of platforms to do that. Uh, we have launched a website and a Facebook page to increase awareness about the potential decisions that have to be made about the property. We've also generated some yard signage that uh, our local supporters can display. Um, these signs are available for pickup uh, on Phillips Street, and we have them every Saturday down at the farmer's market uh, at our table where we encourage people to sign our petition, ask questions, and just kind of understand what we're trying to do in preserving that screen space and support local schools. Next slide. In addition, we've run a series of uh, ads since the beginning of the year, every week that can take you to our website uh, where you can get uh, lots of details on our cause, uh, you can send us emails, ask questions uh, on Facebook also. And we just wanted to try to create some kind of a dialogue so that the community understands what's at stake here regarding the Mills Lawn property. In addition, we uh, did provide a insert uh, in one of the newspapers uh, for residents that don't have internet and that type of thing to, to understand what our cause is and what we're trying to do in preserving that green space. So we've had about 13 ads uh, and the petition insert, uh, which was a couple of months ago. And I think we have somewhere, Terry, you'd have to update me, uh, somewhere over 300 petition signatures at this point in time. Right, either and, 310 and, and, or 312 and still growing. Yeah. And still growing. And this is with just the efforts of the web page. We have some other uh, activities that we're gonna do later in the summer, but this is primarily through the website and Facebook uh, that we've garnered this much support at this point in time. So I'll turn the next slide over to you, Terry. Okay, so just, I'm gonna do just a look at the, uh, the website, uh, millsongreenspace.org, but point out that uh, we are, very similarly, I would think to the McKee group, we're, we're for community awareness and education. And I noticed that you, that was two of your main things, the third being participatory uh, democracy. So 
we have a we have a similar approach to why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and as you can see from our petition statement, we are just trying to get the major government bodies and the school board here to get together and do something that's good for the entire community. School people, uh, school kids, everybody, residents, the ongoing future, what happens here um, by working to make this place a park the best way we possibly can. So if you go to the website, you're gonna find out um, the things we've been telling you today, but in much greater detail. Um, you'll see the story of the past, uh, some of the present concerns, um, and strong points we're making why it should be a public space, we believe. And all of our petition signers are certainly uh, on board with that. At the same time, and it's almost like we have to just keep saying this over and over, we are absolutely for quality schools. I mean, I'm an educator myself. We are for, for quality schools. There's no doubt about that. Um, the types of things we want to try and help make everybody aware of uh, without reading through all these is just what makes our village what it is? Where does the charm and attractiveness come from? Uh, where, is everybody aware of the comprehensive okay. land use plan? You know, are people aware? Do they know that the McBride report laid Mills Lawn out as a highly residential area with homes and all kinds of streets and stuff on it? Do, are they aware of that? That already happened. Are they aware that some people consider Mills Lawn underutilized space? Um, and then this, this last statement down here, I'm not sure if we, that came in from one of our petition signers or where, but it's just the whole idea that this place is our central park. It's at the heart of the village. And if it's gone, it's gone. And there's just no replacing something that's a treasure like this. Um, so without reading all these, once again, as Bernadine said earlier, you can find all of this on the website. You can sign the petition online. You can use PayPal if you choose to make a donation to help out with some of our communication efforts. And you can find number of, also the very last bullet, notice that we have comprehensive references and links to everything we write about on the website from one place or another. So you can see that we're, we're documenting what happened and we're, we're citing our sources on that. Finally, last slide. Um, support has been amazing. You know, it's just been amazing. One of our next efforts coming up will be door hangers. And we have residents or we have our signers ready to help out, uh, to take to the streets, to hang door hangers, to come and get more signs to put in their, on their own property. Um, and one last line here, if you see on the slide here, uh, Annabella Sari is in on this, on this today. She's part of the Yellow Springs Tree Committee. And uh, something we didn't mention in during this thing is that all of the tribute trees that have been planted on Mills Lawn, you can find out more of those on the website and you can see a, a map to find about everyone and a listing of uh, all the people who've made donors, who, who donated the trees and who, to whom they were for. And to know that if there are any leftover funds and we're not gathering a whole bunch of money for this, but that's all gonna go to the Yellow Springs um, Tree Committee. And so with that, um, that's our basic presentation for today. I hope that was clear and you will get all the slides for this. And if there's anything uh, you care to ask us now, I think we're prepared to answer questions. I have a question. What's the problem? This sounds wonderful. Why are you having trouble? Well, it goes back to what we discovered with the comprehensive land use plan. When we thought this was a public, it was always marked as public. Then we realized that uh, that the school board and the city council were using terms like uh, must may be sold to the highest bidder for our fiduciary responsibilities. Then we started wondering what's going on? Is there something that isn't being communicated? That started our interest. And that's when we started thinking, well, maybe we better just raise the awareness on this to see where it's all going. So do you think okay. there is a plot to sell it that they're not telling you about? Um, it's, it's a matter of, I would say, maybe Michael wants to answer that. Well, they, they have said in a number of meetings that they are not selling the property, but the McBride report lists you know, that it could be sold. Uh, and we also, we know that uh, there's a significant levy based on whatever option they pick that they need somehow to try to reduce that levy and to reduce, a way to reduce that would be to sell the property. Um, and we do know that if it were sold, it's hardly any to affect a $35 million levy. 
you know, so. Because McBride report laid out the, the assessed value of everything that the whole property was worth in, in great detail. Um, that's what we started going like, huh, what's going on? Why, why don't we know more about this? Yeah. Could you talk about the statement about the Western two thirds being preserved instead of, what did you see happening with the other third? I, I think, think the other third is highlighted yeah. for commercial development. If, if in fact they did sell the school. Okay. Uh, and that was listed in the comprehensive land use plan, which kind of attracted our attention. Uh, you know, more stores or store frontage or whatever that may be where the school is facing Walnut Street. Okay. And the idea is we're not proposing that anybody get in there and sell that building or anything like that. We're just saying if they continue with the plan and, it, and the building does go away, this would help the whole community to mark that off and make a park out of the rest of it. <laughs> so you, what was the question? I interrupted somebody starting to speak. Well, I'm not sure. What, oh, I'm sorry. Did someone, uh, please, I apologize. I wanted clarification. Remind me what the McBride report was. Okay, if you go to our website, you can click on the link. You'll find approximately a 10 or 12 page document in which the school board paid to have the property assessed um, its value, you know, and it, it laid, and so McBride people laid out, they're the ones that said it's underutilized space and here's what we could do with it. And if you look, you'll see it, it has uh, markings laid out for proposed houses and all sorts of, things. I think anywhere between 30 to 62 uh, high density residential areas could be put on that. It's quite detailed. So. It wasn't just, well, maybe in the future we'll do something, but it was very, very detailed. So you can find that link on our website. Yeah. Thank you. And I think it's clear that, that, our, our, that what we're really proposing is that it's the green space that has existed as green space as long as the community's been here that we're asking to preserve. The original, as somebody who really values the history of a place, the original Mills Lawn was about 20 acres. And I think what we're looking at in the green space where the school isn't is about four or five acres to be maintained as green space central to the community. Um, and the McBride report has already shown how it could be subdivided and sold off in two parcels. I know that I attended Mills Lawn, the original Mills Lawn that um, is no longer there. And uh, it was such a tragedy to see that beautiful old home destroyed. And you look at it now and you recognize that it's a parking lot. And if that's any indication of what the future of Mills Lawn could be, if um, this committee is not successful in abating that, then that's really a sad set for the village. I understand the need to take a close look at the options, what the school has, because they're, they're trying to find funding for a new school system. That makes sense to me. But yeah, to yeah. take away that valuable property right there in the center of town, I think would be tragic. If I had to guess, I would guess that the town would be behind everything you want to do. So I don't then understand what the problem is. Well, the school needs funding. I, I think they're in a tough position right now. And um, our mission is just to make the, the town aware of what options they may have to take and, and to educate the town on the green space. We found, I think initially, that people were not aware that it was zoned for high density housing and, and commercial. Uh, that, was a, that was a surprise to me. And Harry, I'd like to respond to that also. When we have uh, brought the topic up with uh, various members of the school board, uh, just to find out where, what the, how they felt about this, I'm sorry to say we have not received any positive remarks back about how valuable that property is and how it actually benefits the entire community in the same way that a great school system benefits the entire community. We pretty much only heard that their interests are a great school system 
and that's not their that's not their area, you know, to be looking into. So if we had gotten any positive remarks about, we do also want to make sure we save that. That would have, that would abate some of our thoughts, but we're not getting any positive remarks back. Well, the, the, the point is that, that the school board is going to be asking the village for something of the order of $26 million again. And it was turned down decisively a few years ago when it ran. And my guess is that it'll be turned down again, um, which puts the school board in a very different position with respect to you than they are now. Um, right. I think it's 35 million this time. Well, that, yeah. uh, that's correct. But yeah. I expect that the state will provide 19%, which drops our bill down to 26 million, which is still outrageous. It's, 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 it's an outrageous amount of money. The village uh, has a number of people, a large number of people who choose to live here who can't really afford that kind of, of money. Um, it would, it would raise my income taxes by 10%, which is okay, but a lot of other people can't afford to pay that at all. And, and that's really asking more than the village can sustain. And, and that's why they're after no law, in order to get the money that, to have available to do what they want to do. And so that, that's what we're fighting. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm an old, old student of Mills Lawn um, and an old villager. Um, first of all, I'd like to know if, if you've um, done a complete uh, tally, tally of what all, all the villagers, you know, what people are wanting, but also it just seems to me that so much of this boils down to money. And um, I, I've had this idea that we should have a great big, when, when, when uh, Whitehall Farm went up for auction, um, the initial sentiment was being against development. Um, and, and I suggested, well, why don't we be for something like for saving the farm. And, and I'm wondering about whether we could have a great big effort to raise that $35 million and, uh, you know, contact our friends like John Lithgow and Dave Chappelle and um, other people that have, have friends who have friends and just make a huge effort because if we could raise that money, then maybe this wouldn't be as big an issue. I would hate to see this middle of our town destroyed because we couldn't raise money. And um, so I'm just, that's my two cents worth. I kind of feel like, um, uh, We've been paying for that. Every one of us has been paying for that property for 70 years through the school levy. The citizens of this town have supported its maintenance and its upkeep. And I, I think it's important, at least from my perspective, that the community have a say in what happens to that property, that um, it isn't solely at the discretion of the five or six members of the current school board to be making the decision if they decide to dispose, if, the, if, if Mills Lawn, the school is, is no longer there. The other issue is, is that even if Mills Lawn, the school continues as an elementary school, the McBride makes it clear that they could keep the school there and subdivide off the green space and sell it. So right. having a school there doesn't protect it as we think it might. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to acknowledge the person whose hand is raised. Um, yes, please speak. I'm sorry. I, I don't know the technology well enough to push the right button. There <laughs> no, you I don't go. Either. This Thank is you. Peggy Kobernick. 
Hi, thank, thank you. you. It's my understanding that in order to receive state funds with which for building a new facility, the size of our district population is around 600 kids and the state will only give us money if we build a K-12 campus. And the K-12 campus will be where the current high school is. So it's probably a mute point that, well, unless they, you know, because they've got those, still have those four options for the levy that if the levy doesn't pass, Mills Lawn will probably still remain where it is. There's nothing else they can do about it. But <clears throat> when you, if you watch that comprehensive land use planning, two council people voted to keep two thirds of that land in green space, Curlis and Krieger. And the rest of them, including our manager, um, support that it become high density housing because there's a critical need for housing in this community. So it gets really sticky and to how can we really promote that to stay green space? I would love it to stay green space. I think it would be criminal to do otherwise on it. I, I don't know that we're in jeopardy that much of, you know, this is like home ink kind of houses, affordable, Hi, home, Chris. you know, yeah. so that's that's an issue that if the levy does pass, which it, I, I don't know if it will or not, then we have to have a K-12 campus. So I think it goes back to the village to say, hey, what are we doing here? Yeah. I do believe the village is leaning towards the high density That's house. They passed it. They passed the resolution. Of, you know. the <laughs> if you're not speaking, I'm going to ask everyone to right. mute just so we can back uh, uh, eliminate the so, background. Please. I, I, I'm done. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 Peggy, not you. Anybody that no, listens. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I heard it, but thank you. So I'm going to make myself go on mute now, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Floor is open. Well, I'm embarrassed that I hadn't read this McBride report. I vaguely remember statements that must have been based on this, but uh, I urge people to, uh, that, that it has an executive summary at the beginning. You don't mm -hmm. need to read all 12 pages, although I, I plan to. Uh, it talks numbers talks commercial value. And frankly, I see some argument for the entire block being the village green. In 50 years, it'll be a treasure. The whole amount, not just where there are currently buildings. Well, I don't know how to pay for that, but the question is, what do we do? The mental value. Am I permitted to, to, to speak? Yes, Not sir. Everybody agrees with you. Okay. But the question is, what do we do? If I could just re respond to Don real quick. I'm sitting here right now looking across Mills Lawn. And um, if we are successful in saving the Western two thirds, that's significant. But I agree completely that what, what I see right now are trees going all the way to Walnut Street. So I consider that entire area as valuable green space, you know, not, not just up to a border, a two thirds line drawn sort of arbitrarily through Mills Lawn, because there's this entire depth of field that I see there with trees all the way to Walnut Street. And if we lose that western, eastern, or I'm sorry, the eastern one third to commercial or housing or something like that. I think we're going to still feel a big loss on those lawn, but that's, you know, maybe I'm being greedy, but I, but I do agree that, that uh, we want to save what we can, but I, I totally agree, Don. Okay. Four, Thank five, you. three, eight, seven. Right. That's, or the James A. McKee Association. Okay. That's the, yeah. Okay. okay. Can I ask, um, what, what is the mission of the McKee group? Can I, is there a, very much what we are doing right now, and that is to uh, be a platform for the community to learn about important issues of concern to residents and 
start asking, answering the question that I think it was Harry Rose, uh, what can we do about that? How do we support our community and make it the best community for not only the residents, we acknowledge that we need business and the like in order for us to uh, be a sustainable community, but to educate ourselves on critical issues and answer those questions, how can we best serve our community? So in a nutshell, that's the answer to your question. As we as a group, uh, you know, we've tried to engage yes. village council with the school board or dialogue, mm -hmm. and we've we've struggled with that to come up, think out of the box, come up with some ways to, to preserve the space mm -hmm. and, and supply a good quality schools. And we, we haven't been successful <laughs> at that. I, I would dare say that if you get 20 people in a room, you're not going to have total consensus among all of them, especially mm -hmm. if it's going to cost them money or cost them some sort of uh, pay up to pay for it that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Harry made a good point. You gotta figure out what you want. And clearly the, the sort of vague general, we don't want it to be built on is, you know, is understood and agreed to by probably everybody here and elsewhere. But to stop it from happening, you really need some sort of legal requirements so that nobody can ever do anything with it. And it seems to me that that would be a, you know, uh, an ultimate goal to, to put forth if you really want to accomplish something. Otherwise, all you're doing is saying, it's awful you're tearing my park down. And I got to say, I don't want it torn down built on either. And I've been here for almost 40 years. And almost all the time when I go by there, walking, riding, or driving, there's nobody there. So... Well, I, I, I find it I find it a little overblown to say that people are using it all the time because I just uh, don't. I see disagree. That. I disagree. We we see people. There are people out there now. We see soccer practice all weekend. Uh, it gets a lot of use. It gets. A, there's just no doubt about that. Um, so it it is not an underutilized space. It gets used at different times. Like when Shakespeare in the Park is there, it fills right. up. You know, when we have Porch Fest, people are all over the place out there. It just depends on what's going on. It's amazing. It's an amazing space for gathering throughout the year if it's not used, you know, to capacity uh, every single evening, you know, actually. So, but I wanted to follow up on something Michael said a minute ago um, that we have talked to, we know that this needs to happen through village council action. We know they need to be the ones behind this. And we're, we've tried various avenues and as far as even bringing forth some private citizens and some ideas, and we have, uh, we've hit a brick wall, and um, we've been told that what we're what we're offering can't be heard right now because it's not public, and that's not true. We've met, and I'm I'm just defining what when Michael says struggling, we've been trying to bring ideas forth that we think are creative. Um, it can be done without a a giant fundraising effort, maybe similar to to uh, Whitehall. And it might meet the needs of most people in the community. Um, so that's that's been ongoing and it, it has been a struggle of communication. Yeah. And Jerry Sutton's got his hand up. Yes, Jerry. Yeah. Um, Just I, a thought. Uh, has anybody tried to mobilize the Tecumseh Land Trust to negotiate a conservation easement on the property? Uh. I, I think that um, we've, that's been tossed around um, in, in our group and um, essentially what we've been waiting for is just to open up discussions between the school board and the village council about what options might be available and it's a dead end. Nobody wants to talk about the options. The council says it's the school boards and the school board says it's not time to talk. So. Well, it brings us back to Jerry Sutton. <laughs> what he's just suggesting is that you move forward yes. with the Tecumseh Land Trust and just take the weight out of their hands. Don't wait. Exactly. Do yeah. Making them an offer. They're trying to get some value out of the land. Tecumseh's structure to provide them a degree of value. Sure, it's not 
fair market value, full fair market value, but it provides them some money, uh, value, and uh, the, the community gets something in return. How much does it cost? Five million, seven million bucks, 50 cents? It, they've got to work it. They've, uh, we've got conservation easements on the entire thousand acre uh, Glen Helen. You know, the whole village is, uh, has a necklace of conserva conservation easements around the whole two square miles, uh, and they're all over the county. It's just a tool that's in the community, and it would be a basis of uh, trying to satisfy a couple of different parties with a different point of view. I think in addition to what you're saying, Jerry, you are suggesting very strongly that this group, Tecumseh Land Trust, has got the experience. Absolutely. To do what we want to have done, and they have been doing this for a long time and doing it very well. An easement is only as strong as a willingness to enforce it. So, uh, TLT has a number of easements out there. Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't tried to, uh, they haven't been attacked, but they're a, a force in the community. So who do we hmm. talk to over there? Just look at the number. They're <clears throat> the same people that you bought your mulch from, or I got 40 bags from, and I noticed my <laughs> neighbors got a few. I thought I read someplace that there was a dollar amount put on the Mills Lawn property of a few million dollars. I'm wondering if anybody knows if that's true or what it is. I don't. I wonder if it's in the McBride report. It is. They did. Okay. That's, that's the last value we saw. They appraised that land as well as the land out at the high school. How much do you know? At the moment, I don't remember. Maybe Parker does. And as I recall, I'm, I'm looking at the report and it. It does do the back of the report. As I remember, the entire property. Four hundred thousand. How much? A, a range of, let's just say, four to eight million. That they okay. have more detail than those numbers. What, what what I remember is two point seven million dollars for the property, which includes the the, the building, the, the the school building, and the land itself. I think was you know un, undeveloped. Uh, was like nine hundred thousand or so. I, I forget I forget that exact number, but. But it's, it's, it's near the back where they break out the two properties in, in detail. They give an appraised value for the entire property and then a separate piece for the building and the land. So now it's, now it's a goal, find 8 million bucks. And we have talked, I, I talked with Krista McGow some time ago of the Tecumseh Land Trust. And she said that until, and unless the school board wants to engage in that process, that they don't have, there's nothing they can do until the owner, yeah. the owner, would approach them about about putting in a, uh, a, a conservation easement. So we need to make that a more attractive option to them, I guess. Right, because it doesn't sound like that's what Bernadine was saying that they're ready to come to the table for that discussion. The school board, I mean. Right. And I, I think one of the things that that kind of gets lost in this when you're thinking about the value of the property, um, okay, let's say that it sells for top dollar. You're not gonna be able to build affordable housing on mm -hmm. land that four acres that I think there's how many acres right now for sale for $800,000, 30 acres or 15 or 20 um, uh, on, on the edge of town right now. And so, Okay, it goes for top dollar. What can you afford to put there? Uh, the, the, it doesn't make sense economically to uh, because your land prices are so high and with building costs being what they are today. I think it's in some ways a fantasy to believe that you're gonna have affordable housing on that property if it goes for top dollar. One of the plans for the property that I've heard discussions about, I don't believe there's any definitive um, plan in place, 
is that it's mixed use and that what they would do is not only put some affordable housing, but that it would actually be market value housing and it would be an extension of the downtown area. So they want to add more businesses, which would completely change the complexion of the uh, downtown Yellow Springs. But that's one option that they sort of want to um, tear down the school that is currently there and put additional housing as well as businesses in that area, which, I mean, I just cannot imagine if I lived, I, when I grew up, I was on Elm Street, but I can't imagine that in the parking and the, the increased traffic. And I mean, it's a nightmare when you have special events to have that on a regular basis would really be something in the heart of downtown. Which is already very contested. I think we're we're looking at an either or situation, and I can see something like a proposal for a performing arts center that everyone in Yellow Springs could get behind. It would be park like around the center. It would be a recreational area. Um, so there are other choices mm -hmm. that we should be considering. Who's planning all this building right now? That everybody's concerned is going to happen. Is there well, a they here? The village council is primarily, um, I'm trying to think of the right word for that because- Eminent domain is what, be, have they, what they'd have to use because it's not their land. Well, no, but I'm thinking that the village, I, I'm thinking are in some kind of conversation with the school district and at least plotting out options. And let's say they're, they're assuming that they do somehow get access to the to the property. I don't know how that would happen, but let's. I think they're thinking from that perspective. If the property were ours, how could we develop this um, in a way that would be beneficial to the community? My question is, I'm not sure their definition of what's beneficial to the community is the same as mine, and that's that's an issue. I do like Lee the idea of a performing arts center. Mm -hmm on some portion of the property, that piece makes sense. So, you know, in some ways it's a little bit like some of the other properties around town that um, have been developed. I mean, we lost a lot of really important farming property when Cresco came in, but we gained, um, you know, an employer and frankly a good corporation company that came into the village. I mean, there are pro and cons to it. I'll, I'll give you that, but um, so there are pro and cons and it is a difficult choice. Uh, we are nearing uh, the wow. end of our, oh no, it will only have been an hour. We could... Yeah, we've got a little bit of time if people want to uh, chatting. I, have you played around with words like the commons, village common? Village Green, uh, that has, a, to me, a subtle, uh, it, it conveys a social content that preserving green space does not. Don, I was going to point, that's a very good point. On our website, we have research and more links about why communities need a green space, why they have a commons area. And as Bernie was talking about, when Mills laid it out, that's quite clear that it was a park in the middle of town. Um, so th that idea has been there for a long time and the citizens have been using it. The problem is that the, the negotiations or the conversations are not even open enough to say what, how it might benefit the public. Mm -hmm. The answers have been, we can't talk about it or it's too soon to talk or uh, don't worry about it. But other, you know, there's other things that look like you should worry about it. Well, I view this as the village commons. That's more than preserving green space. And I, I think that without going to your website, it would present a message. I agree that what's on the website, it's, it's really a, a deep website, it's great. Uh, but Don, what do you define I mean, I like both those terms. They sound on the surface good. What exactly are you meaning with it? What's, what's involved in village commons? Well, my what's experience- I could lean over it, the green? 
And my, what experience yeah. of Mills Lawn is different than, uh, oh, I'm blanking, than Dad, uh, Dave said. <laughs> Dave Turner. Um, every other day, late afternoon, I'll walk across and most of the time there's somebody else uh, doing something. It might be just walking a dog. Uh, and sometimes I see a friend and we chat. And I think that a, as a, like a park, except in the center of everything, it would be one of those places you run into people such as walking down Xenia Avenue, see an mm -hmm. old friend. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see that uh, expand. It might be more of a village green, village commons. I think um, with the pandemic, we've sort of forgotten about the experience of communities coming together, our community, <laughs> you know, we, we haven't had a street fair. And I, I loved hearing Karen talk about Mills Lawn, the house. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the um, Apple Butter Festival. Oh, yes. Being there. Yes. And there's, there's just no replacement for gathering. Mm -hmm. and if we get rid of that space, even though you know, maybe we're not using it as much because it is a school and, um, but anyway, um, I just think that uh, people coming together is a huge part of the experience of community. Um, yesterday, Jane and I were driving in Springfield and I was, I hadn't been there for a long time. <laughs> and um, I just made me feel so glad to to have Yellow Springs and and if we continue to have money rule whatever we're going to do um, then we're at the slave of the, the slave master and I think that we need to find a way to um, to raise the money that is needed to get to, to, to have the community that we deserve and that we want. Um, so I'll be in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in charge of, of raising the $35 million. Listen. So, so you can relax, I'll take care of it. <laughs> well, I think it's all settled now. Yeah, I was going to say, there you go, that's what we needed. Yeah, go ahead, Bernadine. Um, I, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that in, has always impressed me about Yellow Springs is uh, uh, people talk a lot about the, about the charm, but part of that is because the central part of Yellow Springs was planned. Uh, uh, it was a planned community and it hasn't developed higgledy-piggledy like a lot of the area towns have. And you can go into any town and see what a business district slowly encroaching onto what were once lovely neighborhoods and ruining them. And uh, I think that keeping that green space is part of the original vision for this village. Um, uh, what would make it livable and a charming place to be. And I, I, I feel very strongly that we do owe something to the history and also the hopes for the people that gifted Mills Lawn to the school board. Um, I think there's a moral responsibility to honor those wishes. I could be overstating the fact, but. <laughs> Um, yes, Mary. Hi. Um, I just wanted to chime in saying um, I'm part of the committee and have enjoyed um, watching not only the presentation, but listening to all the questions. It's been fabulous. Um, Don, I think the, the comment about using the phrase village commons is really important. We've talked about that in the committee. And when you use, when you use those two terms of preserving green space, it, yeah, that can have a very um, static feel to it. Okay, we've preserved it. You know, hopefully we preserve it. 
but the village commons communicates that what you were saying you know you meet up with people you interact and that sense of community that you talked about patty and it really gives it a more dynamic sense the the commons and i think I think that's really important that we bring that into our conversations more that it's we're not just looking to preserve we're looking to preserve so we have that opportunity to gather and recreate and communicate and enjoy people at large <laughs> so anyway. is it possible um, to there to the school board oh, is then going to turn around and say to us okay so we'll preserve that as green space how do we get the money we need? Well, I'm in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry, you're right. Yeah. But money is always the issue. But we're trying need, to. You do need a general consensus that this is the direction to go that would help motivate money. That's yeah. the only way to get around the school board. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think we're really hoping that the, it, you're right. I mean, we are so dependent on the entity that now owns the property engaging in um, uh, the effort. And as you said, I mean, who can, who can negate that we want? I mean, who's going to say we don't want this green space? Nobody. Well, I don't know that, but you hope <laughs> not many people. But, um, but yeah, we, we are dependent on the school board um, engaging. And, and we've hoped that the village council would help prompt that or facilitate that. But to date, they're saying just, no, nope, we're not gonna do anything till the school board says they're ready. But we, we need the community at the very least being aware of the risk of, that this land is, is at at this point. And, and then hopefully you, you've, you've, all of you have brought up such great points of um that we that that we need to remember and need to help the, the entire community you know is there a committee to um to even investigate raising whatever money is needed for you know both the green space and of course the schools um is there a fundraising committee do you know at this point seems, for preserving the green space? Well, for pres preserving the green space, but also I think hand in hand with that is raising money for the schools because a lot of need is the schools. And if that can be met, then there's not so much pressure on, you know, <laughs> rid of the green space. Moving to Parker. <laughs> um, and I, I, just, I guess I should mention, I'm, I'm part of our, this same committee and also I was asked to be on the community advisory team for the schools. And so the last meeting that we had where they went over the results of the, the poll that 130 some people out of the village uh, took, um, the, grossly speaking, the poll indicated that, the, that the, there was a, people would like to have a brand new school, but the, they don't wanna pay for it. And so Terry Holden, um, said that it appeared to her that they were gonna to have to have a capital raising campaign in addition to any levy. They were gonna to have to do additional fundraising, hoping for donations to, um, to augment whatever a levy might, might do. So I think, I think they recognize that, that, that funding is, is the issue. And um, to our knowledge so far, there's no, there's no effort to raise the funds to buy Mills Lawn should we need to do that. Um, and it could be, you know, it could be sold um, at auction, and it would be, it would be a shame to just have, you know, not be prepared to bid on it. So, it's something that we as a committee have talked about, but we haven't been willing to go there yet to try to, to try to start that, that sort of campaign because we're waiting to see what the schools really propose in terms of a new levy. It might be premature to, to, to get out there and try to get in front of that. And I did look on it's on, it's on page 13 of the McBride report. Um, where they appraised, and this is in 2019, 8.84 acres, the land $417,000, the building 2.3 million for a total of 2.7 million for the entire land with, with the building. So, you know, with appreciation, we'd be looking at probably raising $4 million or something of that nature. We just, we just haven't gone there yet.
Where is there a link to that report, Parker? Is it, I didn't find it on your website, but I must be looking in the wrong place. Um, Terry, you can help with that, I'm sure. It is yeah, on the website. Uh, you, you I found it. it as a link in the text. And Terry, my, you, you, you my second it. computer's just frozen, so I can't. I'm not sure if I have it or not. I have a memorandum that you're was on back mute, in Terry. Oh. oh, okay. So for dad, you can go on, uh, if you're on the website under green space, you pull down under value to the village. And there's a link oh, about three quarters of the way down the page. On your website, I don't see value to the village. Okay. Not that you, I don't believe it exists. What you do is under green space, there's a pull, there's a drop down menu. Ah. Okay. There's more links. And value to the village. Got and it. got it. Scroll on down there. Yeah. Okay. It's also on the FAQ, a link to that. Okay. Is this on the McKee? I'll, 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 I'll the find McKee? it from here. Thanks. Yeah. Are you talking about the McKee website? No, we're talking about millslawngreenspace.org. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. I did write that down. And is that an actual website? Yes. That's not like on Facebook. That's a website we created. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. It, you said .org? Yes. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So what other, what is uh, your committee doing now? You've got signs circulating a petition. Uh, you've got a great PowerPoint presentation for this event. Have you been presenting it in any other setting or? We're, we're moving toward continuing to raise public awareness, gather even more signatures. We have a signature page uh, idea for the newspaper. We have door hangers coming out. We have lots of volunteers who are gonna do that. So at the moment, as Parker said, we're not sure what the school board is doing yet, but we're gonna to continue to raise awareness and gather even more signatures, as many as we possibly can, just like I said, in the same way that the McKee group works, uh, education and awareness and participation in democracy. That's basically what we're what we're doing, continuing to do. Yeah. 